Dear beloved community, it's so wonderful to be together on this, the 30th day of April in the year 2022. Many times Tay has shared with us that we're already what we want to become. To me, this has two aspects. The first aspect is that which we're looking for is already available for us. This is not too difficult to understand. The capacity to take a mindful breath, to take a mindful step, is at the same time both a practice and a realization. Both a practice and the fruit of the practice. The great Zen teacher Dogen reminds us of something that our teacher Tay has shared with us many times. Meditation, sitting or walking meditation or the spiritual life is not what we're doing. This is the common mistake. My spiritual life or my spiritual practice is based on sitting or walking meditation or chanting the sutras or so on. With this mindset, our practice is a practice that is caught up in doing. Dogen reminds us, just like Tay, that the basis of our practice is called the Dharma door of joyful ease. This is what we call in Plum Village the practice of arriving, or as I like to call it, ah, arriving. Since when you're finally home, you have that delicious feeling of ease, ah, ah, arriving. There are in fact statues of bodhisattvas called bodhisattvas in royal ease. And I like to think of royal ease as being different to the everyday kind of ease that we usually think of, which is when we think of perhaps disconnecting or switching off or withdrawing. That can be a kind of ease for sure. But royal ease here is the kind of ease that emerges when we're able to sit down right in the center of our lives and look clearly at how things have come to be without being pulled this way or that way. In Plum Village, we're always reminded to sit upright and stable, but also relaxed. If someone sits motionless, frozen for 30 minutes or an hour, that's just clenching the body. Some of us clench our body, but many more of us clench our mind around ideas, around views, around positions, even around insights, or perhaps even sometimes around our meditation object. Left to themselves, our bodies are always making micro movements, micro adjustments. Our attention, our mind and our heart also need to do the same. In some way, as meditation practitioners, we tune our attention to the situation at hand like we're tuning a musical instrument. The Buddha was such a wonderful teacher he was always using examples that resonated with his students' lives in order to help them understand and apply the teachings easily and concretely in their lives. In the Pali Canon, in the Anguttara Nikaya, we read a beautiful story that I've told once before of a monk, the Venerable Sona, who before he ordained was a musician and he played the stringed instrument called the Vina. After he ordained, he was very much focused on being determined and putting a lot of effort into his practice. And at one point, he began practicing walking meditation so intensely that his feet began to bleed. At that time, the Buddha called Sona to him and shared the following with him. Sona, before you became a monk, you were a skillful Vina player. Is that right? Yes, my teacher. And Sona, when the strings of your instrument were too tight or too loose, was your vena in tune and playable? No, it wasn't, my teacher. 
So it was only when the strings were neither too tight or too loose that your instrument was in tune and playable. Isn't that right? Yes, my teacher, that's correct, said Sona. And then the Buddha said, in the same way, Sona, if you put too much effort in, you'll become restless. If you're too slack in your effort, then you'll be lazy. Therefore, you should constantly determine the right pitch for your persistence. Attune the pitch of your five faculties to that, and from there, pick up your theme. As the Buddha shared, as practitioners, we tune our tenderness to the situation at hand. Upright and stable here refers not only to the posture, but also having a sense of intentionality around our practice. In a 13th century text by a Zen master, Kezen Jokin, there's a line, don't be concerned about how well or how badly you think you're doing. Just understand that time is as precious as if you were extinguishing a fire in your hair. I love that little uh, uh, paragraph so much because there's a couple of examples in this vivid imagery. First, don't be concerned with how well or how badly you think you're doing. We're often so caught up in comparing and evaluating. In Plum Village, we have the phrase, happiness is knowing that you're on the right path. We touch our deepest aspiration and set ourselves in that direction. And then we allow the Dharma to do its work. Since the Dharma has as one of its innate qualities, the capacity to lead us onwards. But how do we not be concerned or so concerned with how well or how badly we think we're doing. We decide not to be concerned with it, to let it go. Our only job as practitioners regarding our attention is to cultivate the capacity to simply show up in each moment and to stay in the room. So we make the decision to recognize when we're comparing, we're evaluating, judging how well or how badly we're doing and we choose to let it go and we choose to develop and focus our attention on developing the capacity to constantly choose to show up and then to choose to stay in the room. We sit just because, we walk just because, we read the sutra just because. If there's any reason at all, it's because we like it. It's part of us. It's not something that we do not a project, and it's also something that we don't do. This not being concerned about is not coming from a lack of care or indifference. And this can be subtle. It's about creating a sense of spaciousness, joyfulness and playfulness in our heart and mind and hopefully in our practice life as well. Of nurturing a sense of enjoyment rather than hard labor. In fact, not being concerned with and indifference are worlds apart. This lack of concern is something that we discover primarily in my experience through a combination of repetition and time, through showing up and staying in the room of the great days and the great moments and also the so-called rough days or rough moments. If we do something every single day for an extended period of time, it stops feeling like a big deal. We begin to see that a challenging practice or a challenging day isn't such a big deal. We begin to notice also that a so-called great or fantastic practice also doesn't mean that much. We have our highs and our lows, but through it all, the constant thread is showing up regardless. This is what lack of concern in meditation practice looks like. Whatever we do is as natural for us as breathing. 
we approach our practice in as natural a way as breathing. Speaking of breathing, let's enjoy a sound of the bell. The second line in this teaching, understand that time is as precious as if you were putting out a fire in your hair. It's a strong line and it's a very famous Zen image. It's tempting to joke that I don't need to focus too much on this line because I don't really have any hair. But this is a, a very deep line and there's a couple of layers to it. On one level, of course, there's a message of urgency. And that's how this line is usually understood. Life's short, so don't waste your time. Life is short, and it's getting shorter every day. The Buddha's invitation is to recognize that, to recognize that reality with every incoming and outgoing breath. The other aspect of this is the invitation to what we call a single-minded intention. If your hair is on fire, other things like whether the room is hot or cold or you need a cup of tea or that person left their dirty dishes in the sink or thoughts like, I'm not a good practitioner. I'm not so important in that moment. The technical term for this experience is focusing on your great concern, not small concerns. If your hair is on fire, you want to put that fire out as quickly as possible. And while you're doing it, while you're putting your head in the bucket, everything else is secondary. Without any thought, all of these other small concerns, small comforts drop away and you can see them for what they are. We can let them go completely in that moment. We, don't, we feel like we don't need these things anymore. We feel like we never actually did. What we need to do is to put the fire out in our hair. This is not something intellectual. In that moment, we don't sit down and evaluate all of these things. We just do it. This is not somebody telling you or you convincing yourself that you need to let go of these things perhaps a long list of resolutions or vows. This is the natural behavior of someone who has discovered their real concern and orientates their life around it. It becomes natural. It becomes something very easy. And that naturalness to me, that sense of ease, of other concerns just dropping away is one of the most important foundations for right effort. By the way, please, it probably bears saying, please don't go and set your hair on fire. This is only a metaphor for the natural focus that occurs when we discover and we refocus our lives on our real concern. We stop messing around and we get real, maybe for the first time. Rather than getting something or going somewhere, meditation practice is all about something that to many of us seems quite unromantic. It's about the capacity to begin again and again with every breath, with every step, with each experience. Each step, each breath, 
Each moment is the very first, that sense of wonder and delight when we experience something for the first time. And at the same time, we savor each breath and each step as if it's the very last time that we'll ever experience them. This is the energy of the beginner's mind. And this is an important quality when we consider sources of energy and also our over tendency towards efforting or hard labor. This is the recognition of the reality that we have always been at our ultimate destination. We've just never realized it. So many times our ideas or our concepts can prevent us from touching reality and prevent us from touching what it is we're seeking. And that thing that we're seeking is right there under our feet all the time. One of the biggest challenges to me that I think that we face in our time is the capacity of being able to focus our minds on our own experience, our embodied experience. And so we often mistake the accumulation of knowledge for insight. And if we're honest, we tend to bring this attitude to our Dharma practice as well, thinking that if we accumulate one more retreat or one more set of teachings, then we'll finally get there wherever there might be for us in that moment. Never really grasping that it's this very tendency to hold on to and look for things that we think we don't have, which is actually the core of our suffering. The phrase that you are already what you want to become, which we hear in Plum Village, and which I began this talk with this evening, also to me, has a second layer, which is equally important to understand, particularly in terms of right effort and also in terms of the fourth realization of the eight realizations in general. That is that all our actions of body, speech and mind have brought us to this moment right now. Last year, I received an email from a practitioner. I receive a lot of emails and, and messages, and this one's kind of stuck in my mind. <laughs> that practitioner recommended to me that I not use the word powerful. It annoyed that practitioner when I used the word powerful in Dharma talks, which is probably a Dharma talk in and of itself. Um, so I'd like to apologize to that practitioner if that person is, um, is listening to this talk, but I, in this moment, I feel that I need to use that word since the realization that all of our actions of body, speech, and mind, the fact that they've brought us to this moment, to me, that's a powerful realization. It's an empowering realization. In fact, it's the very realization that the Buddha woke up to under the Bodhi tree. What the Buddha woke up to under the Bodhi tree in his awakening experience was what we call dependent origination or interdependent co-arising. This is because that is. This is not because that is not. Everything arises due to causes and conditions and nothing arises in and of itself. The understanding that everything, whether it's a flower, a tree, our anger, our happiness, needs different factors to arise, to remain, and then to pass away or to transform into something else. Often we can have a somewhat simplistic view Using the metaphor of seed and flower, for example, we think of the seed as the first cause. And maybe we think of the plant or the flower as the end result. However, who's to say that the blooming of the flower is the end result? The flower is an ongoing process 
just as causes and conditions gave rise to the blooming of the flower, causes and conditions continue to manifest forever into the future. Just as they've been arising also from beginningless time, the flower's withering gives rise to further conditions and causes and manifestations. It's actually an endless process. This is, of course, looking forward. And looking backwards, what's the first cause of the flower? Is it the seed? The seed is not the first cause because the seed also existed in various forms before it came, all those causes and conditions came together in the form of the seed. The seed is the result of a whole stream of causes and conditions from beginningless time that have come together in a particular form for a certain period of time with a few more conditions, water, soil, rain, sunlight, and so on. It can continue its process in a certain form, let's say the plant or the flower, with other conditions. If, for example, the seed is there, um, but the conditions are not sufficient for a plant or a flower to manifest, as one would expect, it will continue its growth of causes and conditions in a slightly different form, in another direction. We can reflect on interdependent co-arising in the forward direction. This will give rise to that and so on. And also in the reverse direction, gradually coming to an understanding of how something, whether it's a flower, whether it's a situation, whether it's an emotion and so on, has come to be. Dependent origination is one of the deepest and most profound insights in Buddhism. It is powerful. Let's enjoy a sound of the bell. In this talk, we're continuing our reflections on the eight realizations, and in particular, we're reflecting on the fourth realization. And in uh, uh, Plum Village, we use the translation from Tai, which is the fourth realization is the awareness that indolence is an obstacle to practice. We must be diligent. We must practice diligently to transform unwholesome mental states that bind us. And we must conquer the four kinds of Mara in order to free ourselves from the prisons of the five aggregates and the three worlds. In my book on the eight realizations, I also offer two other translations. Uh, one of the translations is from the Venerable Master Xin Yun, the founder of Four Kuan San, and he translates the fourth realization as realize that laziness leads to downfall. Be diligent and break the hold of harmful fixations. Defeat the four demons and escape the prison of this dark world. So the Sutra on the Eight Realizations of Great Beings offers us a structured form of contemplation, a framework for our mindfulness practice in order for us to realize these things for ourselves, to be able to embody and realize the Noble Eightfold Path for ourselves. So far through this series of talks and hopefully in our 
daily practice, we've been contemplating impermanence, dukkha, or dissatisfactoriness. The five skandhas, the nature of mind and body, samsara, desire, motivation, and our tendency to fixate on things that we think are going to ease the pain just a little. We put a lot of effort into having material comforts, and on top of that, we want mental and spiritual comfort. This is not a bad thing. But the kind of comfort most of us seek is a kind of quick fix comfort. We keep ourselves busy chasing after happiness and running away from suffering. Or putting aside suffering, running away from even just the slightest discomfort for most of our lives. In this way, we're not really addressing the root of our dissatisfaction, our suffering, or, and we're not really taking the opportunity to nurture the root or the cause of happiness. And once we realize that we can make the decision, rather than focusing on small comforts, to let go into our real concern and to come to understand and gradually transform the roots of the way that suffering manifests for us. So where on earth do we start? Without wanting to be cliched, the place to begin is right where we are now. With whatever we're feeling, whatever we're thinking, whatever we're experiencing right now. This path that is uniquely yours begins where, we, where you are with how you are right now, emotionally, physically, and so on, with the willingness to bring all parts of ourself in this very moment to our spiritual practice, with no exceptions. This is where we start, and in a wonderful way, it's also the fruition of our journey. Let's say we're feeling tired, it's not something to get rid of, and only then does our real practice begin. Start there. That's actually our path in that moment. We practice with the tiredness. We practice with the frustration. We practice with the jealousy, the anxiety, the happiness, all of these things that come to be or have come to be are our teachers. Maybe the greatest ones we'll ever find. Remaining with what arises and looking deeply into how it came to be and what it will become is what's meant by fully walking through a Dharma door and then remaining in the room. And what matters in terms of our spiritual life is that once we've walked through the door, as I said earlier, please remain in the room of whatever you're experiencing, shining the light of mindfulness looking deeply into what we're experiencing and choosing not to run away anymore. Real and transformational practice is not necessarily glamorous. It's most often not. It's not Instagrammable. <laughs> There's often not really anything to say, not really a status update. It comes out of turning towards rather than away from the ordinary humdrum moments of our life. Many years ago, before I was lucky enough to come to Plum Village, I participated in a meditation retreat. And every day we would have a one-on-one -on -one interview with the meditation teacher. Um, each day I would, I guess everybody else too, but um, I can only speak from my own experience. Every day um, I would show up in the teacher's room and in that time I had together with the teacher for an interview, I would offer all kinds of status updates. What was happening in my meditation, what was happening during the whole day of the retreat, what I was thinking about, all of these things. And I had so many questions. And at the end of uh, each day, when I would go in and have my, uh, my session, my interview, the teacher would just bow and say, keep going. <laughs> then one day, after a period of time, 
uh, of uh, this meditation retreat. When I had my interview, I came in, I sat down, and when the teacher asked me to share about my practice, something had changed. I simply sat there, and I had nothing to say, but I simply smiled. I had nothing to share in that moment, nothing with words anyway. And the teacher, he looked at me and he smiled and said, finally. And then I was given a bit more instruction. The Buddha's wisdom is that real and transformative practice is embodied and simple practice showing up. Again, it's not necessarily Instagrammable, nothing against Instagram. It's uh, not a status update. It's just touching deeply the heart of our life just as it is, rather than endeavoring to float above. We journey right to the heart of our lives. The first area to look at in this realization is examining our motivation for practice. Or as I shared earlier, our real concern. This helps us in our practice to be very concrete rather than to float above. What's your real concern? What brought you to practice? What are you practicing exactly? Why? This is, these are very important questions to reflect on every day. Perhaps even a few times a day. What am I practicing and why? The second area for reflection that's mentioned in this realization is something that we've spoken about a lot this evening and that's engaging with our everyday lives as our spiritual practice and not compartmentalizing our spiritual life and our everyday life. And this is something that is really emphasized in Plum Village. Sometimes people uh, ask why Plum Village monastics in our um, uh, retreats, like the summer retreat and so on, we don't sit for many hours a day. And Taze always reminded us that what we do when we're not sitting on the cushion is as important as what we're doing on the cushion. To have that energy of what uh, we, we, uh, what Taze shared with us in Vietnamese is called Min Mak or continuousness. Um, having that continual kind of mindfulness. And one of the key reflections in this realization is laziness. Within the context of this realization, this is laziness manifesting as a lack of energy and motivation, a kind of dullness. And that's definitely a big obstacle to our spiritual practice. In contrast, the capacity to rest body and mind is actually the absolute essence of Buddhist practice, Buddhist meditation practice. And this is laziness, not as an obstacle, but as a realization. This is the kind of space that we don't tend to offer ourselves anymore. Many of us have a seriously diminished capacity to rest, to do nothing to enjoy the space outside of space and the time outside of time. We see this as an indulgence, but it's actually a necessity. In addition to laziness, a couple of other key areas are mentioned in this realization, such as diligence, unwholesome mental states, the four kinds of Mara or the four demons, the five skandhas and the three worlds. There's a lot in this realization. And we'll only be reflecting on a couple of key points this evening. I invite you to continue exploring this realization the whole of your life. The Pali Canon speaks of five hindrances, pancha nivarana, which are traditionally considered to be deep-rooted obstacles to our spiritual development. And the third of these hindrances is called sloth and torpor, tinnamidda. And it refers to 
mental and physical states of dullness, boredom, sleepiness, or a lack of alertness in general. I guess we could say that sloth relates to a, a feeling of physical heaviness and torpor relates to mental dullness or lack of motivation. And this hindrance is very much related to the next of the five hindrances since both of them are extremes and in some way they kind of mirror each other. There's the extreme of procrastination and there's also an extreme of overdoing, of agitation. There's a difficult, there's a, a, a difference between being physically tired and the hindrance of sloth and torpor, which is a kind of heaviness of body and a, a dullness of mind, which just has a kind of lack of energy and also has a, a resistance to some kind of beneficial activity, um, something that we know will be beneficial for us. We just don't have the motivation to do it. It feels like too much trouble. The Buddha shared that the root cause of this experience, this hindrance, is actually unwise attention, or in other words, applying mindfulness incorrectly. Mindfulness, as Te taught us, is always mindfulness of something, paying attention to something. And the Buddha invited us to cultivate what the Buddha called appropriate attention, Yoniso Maniskara. It means directing our attention to that which nurtures those qualities that we want to see in ourselves, we want to develop in ourselves and in the world around. Here, with regard to this hindrance of sloth and torpor, the Buddha shared with us that the root cause is us paying attention to, uh, to things that don't nurture these beneficial qualities. The hindrance of sloth and torpor is described as being similar to being imprisoned in a cramped, dark cell, being unable to move freely in the bright sunshine outside and that that situation is transformed by generating appropriate attention to the factors of energy and investigation. I like to translate uh, uh, vichaya as curiosity rather than investigation. Investigation sounds a, a little too analytical, but curiosity uh, is something that is quite easy to understand and also easy to develop. I like to invite my friends when I'm uh, teaching meditation here in Mountain Spring to develop, along with awareness of our breath, to develop a sense of curiosity with the breath, uh, to uh, zoom in and to notice all of the different ways that the breath is experienced by our body, to always discover something new. This is the energy of curiosity and I find it to be a, a very helpful way to approach what is sometimes translated as investigation. And one effective way to generate energy is deliberately developing this curiosity and interest in whatever we're doing. Trying to see what more we can discover through that experience. What haven't we seen yet? Something that seemed quite ordinary if we develop that sense of curiosity about it, becomes really fascinating, becomes interesting. Sloth and torpor can be quite subtle and can manifest in really strong ways, but also very subtle ways, such as just wanting to be comfortable and not being willing to challenge ourselves to grow or to develop, to get out of our comfort zones. Laziness or indolence appear in two translations of this realization. And I think laziness is something that we can relate to a little more than indolence. And in the context of this realization, as I shared earlier, laziness refers to that dullness and lack of motivation and not to the capacity to rest, which is essential. Speaking of rest, 
let's enjoy coming back to our breathing and enjoying a sound of the bell. The fourth of the five hindrances and the kind of counterbalance to sloth and torpor is restlessness and remorse. It can also be translated as restlessness and worry. In a sense, it's like the opposite of sloth and torpor. And this hindrance, like sloth and torpor, has two related aspects. Restlessness here is restlessness of the body. We've all either been the person or often we've sat next to the person who just can't sit still. Their knees, their legs are shaking, they're fidgeting constantly. One time we had a young guy come to the sitting meditation at Deer Park Monastery where I was living at the time and he sat in front of me during the meditation. They always tend to sit in front of me for some reason. During that period of sitting meditation, he sat like he was sitting on hot charcoal. And by the time the meditation had ended, he'd fidgeted and moved so much that he'd turned on his cushion and mat almost 90 degrees. Or perhaps it's we ourselves in meditation. Right, this is going to be the one. And then suddenly a fly or a mosquito comes around or our shoulders are aching or uh, we, our knees are hurting, we shift our knees, uh, this is itching, we scratch that, or the person near us is breathing heavily and it's annoying, a car goes by, it's annoying, there's a, a smell of incense, it's annoying, and so on. This is restlessness. In Buddhist psychology, in the commentaries, it's said that whenever a not yet skillful and akusala seed arises in our consciousness it's always accompanied with the seed of restlessness the original text commentary on restlessness describes the experience of restlessness as being like a hyperactive mongoose which is a very visceral image i think we can all relate Restlessness is the physical aspect of this hindrance and remorse or worry is the mental aspect. Since the root cause of this hindrance is seen or the Buddha shared with us that the root cause of this hindrance is being caught in a pattern of finding fault in ourselves and in others and in situations. A very helpful practice if we find or we notice this hindrance emerging in us is to focus in on what's not wrong, what's going all right, on contentment and on being satisfied with what we have right here and right now, rather than always wanting more or focusing on what we need to fix. As Tay has reminded us in his practice verse, you have enough. Even though they're traditionally called hindrances, I think it's a fundamental mistake to fight tooth and nail against them like they were enemies. They're actually the ground of our practice itself. And I think that if we bring mindful attention to each of them, they're actually the sources of our insight. Where do you think that your insight or your transformation is going to come from if not from looking into and understanding the challenging things. To me, I think we should consider them as friends on the path rather than enemies that we're in a death match with and we think I've got to get rid of this. This is bad. Let me push this away so I can get back to my real practice, my real meditation, whatever that is. 
we're not going to get very far that way. When we become aware of a hindrance arising, why not make it the object of your meditation and your deep looking? What are the causes and conditions in my mind, my heart, my body, my environment that brought this to be? If I don't take care of it, looking forward, what will this give rise to? If I do take care of it, looking forward, what will that give rise to? If, for example, we notice in our meditation that we begin thinking, I'm such a bad practitioner, my mind's all over the place, we should stop right there. And we should recognize that while it might be true that our mind is all over the place, calling ourselves a bad practitioner is also one manifestation of ill will. Name it. Call it out. Okay, ill will, I know that you're there. We've played out this story for so many years in so many different ways. Let's try something different today. And if I asked you, what's the medicine to apply when we notice ill will arising, whether a strong form of ill will or just in a subtle form, like closing down slightly or avoiding? It's applying loving kindness. So don't fight against ill will. That would be using ill will to fight ill will. And that's not practicing with insight or intelligence. Loving kindness is not a feeling. It's a skill we can develop. And to me, loving kindness here means developing the capacity to be open to whatever's taking place and choosing not to play the victim anymore. To me, meditation in general is not a passive process, but rather an active one. We're developing a skill and we're also becoming skillful, hopefully. Even though we're developing a skill, it's incredibly joyful. I myself sit meditation because I enjoy it. I enjoy walking meditation. Nobody tells me to do it. Of course, we've got our daily schedule in the monastery and we participate in it. But outside of that, I find time to sit in my room or I sit outside, I practice walking meditation and so on for myself. I do these things because I love them, not because I have to. What do you love about your meditation practice? This is a very important reflection. I hesitate to say powerful, but it is also powerful. What do you love about your meditation practice? If you love it, it's so easy to do it. When we enjoy something, it becomes natural to want to devote ourselves to it, whatever it is, and it naturally gives rise to this quality that we call effort. If it's something that you love, if it's something that you've set your heart upon, as in the example of how our real concerns are clarified if our metaphorical hair is on fire, it becomes so natural to devote yourself to it. Hopefully the thing that you choose to devote yourself to will be somewhat skillful. If we nurture our enjoyment, then naturally in and of itself, something called right effort or the four right efforts, which are mentioned in this realization, emerge. Right effort is one of the aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. And please notice that this is right effort and not just effort in the sense of flailing around. Many of us are habituated to striving or efforting in our daily lives and effort in Buddhist practice is quite different. It's focused intentionality in all its forms to our great concern, our real concern which for many of us is our spiritual transformation, our healing. 
the four right efforts are a concrete framework to cultivate intentionality around what we want to manifest in our heart, mind and life. I guess you could say that this is the Buddhist version of the secret. Um, this is the Buddhist version of manifesting the four right efforts. The first aspect of the four right efforts is where we dedicate ourselves to not nurturing unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen in ourselves and in others. How do we know if a thought, a word or an action is skillful or unskillful? One way to reflect on this is to consider whether it's in line with our deepest aspiration, our deepest concern. Does it lead to more inner or outer freedom, to more simplicity, more insight? Does it nurture peace, understanding or joy? Or does it lead to further entanglements? If we reflect in this way and we're dedicated to our own inner transformation, then rather being a struggle over time, it becomes quite easy to consciously choose not to engage with watering unskillful qualities in ourselves and in others that haven't yet manifested, that are lying dormant in our store consciousness in seed form. What do we really want to see in our mind and in our lives? Through applying the right efforts, we have an opportunity to cultivate, to consciously cultivate what we want to see. If we understand where to apply right effort, then we can be intelligent practitioners and make choices that are in alignment with our deepest aspiration rather than behaving passively. With that insight, then we don't need anybody else to tell us what we need to do or not do. We know it for ourselves. The second of the four right efforts is practicing to transform unskillful qualities that have already manifested. Let's imagine that we're experiencing anger and frustration. Right effort here is to kindly and lovingly recognize what's happening, to take care of it, to ask ourselves if we want to see more anger and frustration in our life, or if we wish to nurture different qualities. If we discover when we reflect on this that we want to nurture different qualities, then it becomes quite easy to choose a slightly or a radically, as the case may be, like reorientation of our attention away from nurturing the already arisen anger, which will only end up leading to a worse situation. And to refocus around looking deeply into why it arose, what it has to teach us, and how we can use that wisdom to help us understand the person or the situation that we think has made us suffer. The third of the four right efforts is to create the right conditions for the arising of skillful qualities that haven't yet arisen. Let's say in this moment we recognize that we're not feeling happy. We don't feel peaceful. We don't feel joyful. And these are qualities that we want to manifest in our life. Then if we're an intelligent practitioner, and we all are, we'll ask ourselves, what do I need to do in this moment in order to nurture these qualities? What conditions can I create for these qualities to manifest, to be nurtured? Maybe walking in the sunshine or flower arranging or sitting meditation and so on. I think it's a great practice to craft a strategy for nurturing good qualities and making it a habitual pattern in our life. Tay once shared with us monastics many years ago uh, uh, that we should each write ourselves a love letter, um, a letter that reminded us of why we embarked on this path. Uh, whether it was a path of practice or our monastic life. Um, what is our bodhicitta and things. And then to keep that love letter to ourselves in a very safe place. And that whenever we are feeling a little bit down, we feel like we can't take another step or something, to open that letter and to read it. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing for all of us to do. And I wholeheartedly recommend it. 
I have often <laughs> read my letter and each time I, I see like, oh yeah, this is just a small situation that I'm dealing with. Um, actually, my real concern is, is something uh, quite larger. So perhaps you might want to take some time to consider what beneficial qualities you want to manifest and list them out on a sheet of paper. And then consider what attitudes and behaviors would nurture those qualities in you. And through that practice, just like the practice of writing yourself a love letter all about that which moves you on this path of transformation, you build up a resource for those moments when you will be feeling overwhelmed with sadness or loneliness or depression and so on. In other words, we take responsibility for creating the conditions to nurture those qualities that we want to see in our life. And as we develop this particular form of right effort, our attention begins to refocus away from what's wrong in any given moment to what's going well. I call this the practice of yes and. Yes, there is this situation. And what else is there? These supportive conditions might be very simple things that we've never noticed until now, such as when we sit in a chair. We just notice something like, oh, my body has no pain in this moment. And then when we notice that, that's a condition of happiness right there and then. And then that energy begins to infiltrate the whole of our life. The next of the four right efforts is cultivating and maintaining skillful qualities that have already arisen. If you have a quality that you want to consciously nurture, you treat it like a guest in your home, a wonderful friend that you wish would stay forever. And it's natural if you have such a friend visiting you that you want to do everything in your power to have them remain with you for just a little bit longer. If we understand what nurtures happiness, or joy or insight, for example, and we want to maintain those qualities in our consciousness and in our life, then we continue to engage in attentively nurturing those qualities. So if we were to summarize, right effort is all around consciously choosing which qualities to nurture and not nurture in our hearts and in our lives. And this is really the great freedom and indeed the great power that we have as humans, the capacity to choose where to direct our attention. One key phrase that occurs in the fourth realization is unwholesome mental formations that bind us. In our school of Buddhist psychology, the Vijnanavada school, there are 51 seeds bija in Sanskrit, which are divided into skillful, not yet skillful, and indeterminate. Seeds or bija in Sanskrit, in simple terms, are emotions or mental formations that haven't yet arisen. Just like in the garden, a plant exists in seed form. And when there are enough conditions, warmth, water, the soil, and so forth, the seed sprouts. The seeds in our consciousness are, consciously, uh, are constantly being stimulated by sights, by sounds, by uh, physical objects that we come into contact with, sensations, and so on. Over the course of our lifetime, certain seeds have been habitually stimulated for each one of us, more often than others. And these seeds will tend to arise more readily since we've developed the habit of stimulating those seeds. It's important to understand that there's an individual aspect to this, but there's also a collective aspect that might be beneficial for us to consider. For example, our family, our nation, and so on, might also have seeds that are habitually stimulated. Certain collective habitual patterns of path or, or pathways of joy and of suffering. This is not good or bad. It's just something to recognize 
whichever seeds are consciously and continuously being stimulated will be closer to the surface. It can be a very helpful practice to check in with ourselves every time we practice stopping and to consider what's arising in our consciousness at that moment. And what's the shade of feeling that we're experiencing? I think I've told the story before of how my grandmother always used to keep a kind of soap. I don't know if it's available in other countries. It's called cashmere bouquet. And she always liked the lavender fragrance of that soap. I don't even know if they sell it anymore. I don't really linger around the soap aisle in the supermarket, but she used to put a bar of this soap um, in all of her clothing drawers and also when I was living with her in my clothing drawers as well so I also smelled like cashmere bouquet. Now whenever I smell lavender I think of my grandmother and I have all of the associations both positive and yet to become positive that arise together with the image of my grandmother. We all have these associations and in fact, most of the time in our daily life, it's these conscious and unconscious associations that shape much of what we call reality. Everything that arises has associations that arise along with it, either because of family history, genetics, um, uh, experiences that we've had over the course of our lifetime, and so on. Certain seeds have been stimulated more often. And each time a stimulus occurs, a sound, a smell, a taste, and so on, a seed is touched and it arises into mind consciousness, into conscious awareness, whether for a brief moment or for a longer period of time. And at that point, we call that a mental formation. The seed that sprouted, we call a mental formation. Although if we grasp interdependent co-arising a little bit, then we could also call a plant, uh, if we use the imagery, the metaphor of the seeds in our consciousness and the sprouting of a seed being a mental formation, we could call a plant a seed for two reasons. The first is that the plant is the seed in a different form but it's also the plant it's it's also the fact that the plant itself is a seed for a future manifestation or for future manifestations for causes and conditions that will continue to arise for in the forward direction in terms of our mind a seed and a mental formation are not the same exactly but it bears mentioning that a According to the insight of the Buddha, they're also not different. And so mental formation is the technical term for an emotion or a thought. A seed is stimulated and it arises and remains for a period of time, a split second or 25 years or longer in some cases. Seeds are stimulated, they arise, they remain for a period of time. And then depending on whether they're given conditions to remain or not, they eventually seek down to store consciousness. This cycle is constantly going on in every moment. And as meditation practitioners, we consciously choose to stimulate the seed of mindfulness or appropriate attention, creating conditions for mindfulness to be a habitual response. And then for this quality to remain on the conscious level for as long as possible. Let's enjoy a sound of the bell. last area that we'll look at as we come to a close in this talk this evening is the phrase the four kinds of demons and 
This phrase might be a little unusual for many of us. When we think of compassion or loving kindness, we tend to think in terms of a celestial bodhisattva such as Avalokitesvara or so on, floating down on a cloud and sprinkling nectar everywhere. Uh, flower petals dropping from the sky and all of this kind of imagery. This is, of course, one aspect of loving kindness and compassion. However, there's another face of compassion as well, and sometimes that face can be fierce and protective. The traditional term for this fierce aspect of compassion is called Dharma protection. In fact, in the Metta Sutta, one of the foundational sutras, we find a key line, just as a mother loves and protects her only child at the risk of her own life. Have you ever seen how fierce a mother can be when her child is threatened? Compassion or loving kindness is not passivity. It contains two aspects, loving and protecting, responding in a way that's appropriate to the situation. Buddhism is very practical. When we hear the phrase, the four kinds of demons or four kinds of Mara, we might have a tendency to think of demons or spirits that are wandering around everywhere. The word Mara actually means illusion. And if we find that relating to these four demons as four illusions is a helpful and concrete way to approach them, then that's great. Earlier, I mentioned that in our particular lineage of Buddhism, we come from the mind-only school. In this school of Buddhism, the mind doesn't exist independently of what we call the world. The outside doesn't exist independently of what we call mind. The two are interrelated. It's not something outside of our own mind that keeps us trapped in suffering. But rather, as it says in this realization, it's the unwholesome mental factors that bind us. So the first of the four demons or the four maras mentioned in this realization is unwholesome mental factors. And so earlier we mentioned developing the awareness of mental factors within us that don't nurture what we'd like to see in ourselves or in the world. And that the foundation for this awareness is understanding that our deep understanding our deep aspiration or our real concern and aligning our lives fully with it and this requires a certain amount of discernment also later i'd really like to share more about this quality of discernment because i feel it's an essential quality for a meditator but we'll save that for another time the second of the four demons is identifying ourselves with the five skandhas, with form, with feeling, with perception, with mental formation and consciousness. Many of us identify ourselves quite strongly with our body, for example, and with crow's feet appear around our eyes or we begin to see gray hair, we kind of have an existential crisis. And there are whole industries built up around this idea that aging is wrong, just a shot of Botox and everything is going to be okay. As I get older, I often joke that people around me greet me differently. They used to ask me, how are you? Now they ask me, are you okay? In Mountain Spring, in our brother's hamlet, we have a custom of greeting and checking in with each other every morning after sitting meditation. And so a few days ago, I wasn't feeling particularly out of the ordinary, but the other brother here in the monastery greeted me by saying, my dear teacher, I have a lot of compassion in my heart for you today. You look so tired. Life keeps us humble. So we can get rid of the crow's feet maybe, but then something else related to old age will arise, maybe arthritis or so on. So please contemplate deeply. In what way is this body, which in this very moment is changing and disintegrating, really me? And then we continue, once we've come to an understanding 
a, a, an embodied understanding of this process in our body. We continue the contemplation with the other skandhas like feelings, painful, pleasant and mixed perceptions, our mental formations and the seeds in our consciousness. Are any of these permanent? Which one is you? And also out of those five areas, those five skandhas, which one do you find yourself identifying with more strongly moment to moment? This can be a very helpful practice when we notice a strong emotion arising. To identify ourselves with form, with feeling, with perception, with mental formations or with consciousness is a form of illusion since all of these are impermanent. They're in a constant state of change. Every single second, millions of cells in, are being born and are dying in our bodies. And our even if we consider our mind, our mind uh, 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 is giving rise to so many thoughts each and every minute. If you've ever watched your thoughts during meditation, you'll notice that one thought will lead to another and to another and to another very quickly. The third of the four demons is death or annihilation. Death or annihilation is the big one. For many of us, it can be also the most scary. We have a concept of a lifespan, whether it's a physical lifespan or the lifespan of an experience or an idea. We think it began at some point and we think it's going to end at some point. If we have entered that contemplation on interdependent co-arising deeply, what's the beginning point of something? And when does something end? And is it only one thing? Or is it so many causes and conditions that have come together for a certain period of time? And that will then uh, move on into many different manifestations in many different directions. This is how we can understand this, uh, this demon. And understanding these demons are really important since they're very practical ways for us to be able to see where our mind is fixated. Finally, the fourth of the four demons or maras is distraction. Distraction here needs to be considered on the micro level, but also the macro level. It is the moment by moment lapses in attentiveness that we experience, but it can also be losing sight of our real concern our deepest aspiration. So as we can see, Buddhist practice and particularly these eight realizations are very concrete. They're invitations for us to reflect on our life and to enter whichever door among the insights in these realizations which speaks to us at this moment in time because actually by entering one door, we enter them all. We enter all the realizations in some way. Each of these realizations, as we can see, is incredibly condensed. And they're each just a starting point, an invitation for us to be able to contemplate these realities in our lives. So for me, I hope that you continue your own reflections and explorations the whole of your life, touching on ever deeper levels the riches that are contained in each one. Please don't wrestle with them as concepts. But as we move through our daily life, let's contemplate them as uh, we come into contact with sights, as we come into contact with sounds and with other experiences, then the insights in these realizations will offer themselves to us as lived realities. 
Dear beloved community, I do hope uh, something has been helpful uh, for you this evening. It's been such a delight to be together with everyone and like to come to a close with three sounds of the bell. <laughs>